licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk, usually on Sundays at 12 noon. However, this week and next week, it will be on at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time and 9 p.m. Eastern time because I'm in Thailand. So, hi. Um, anyway, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Thomas and Company for um, professionally house sitting my house and my dog and sending me random pictures throughout the day and night to let me know everything's good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, anyway, there is that. Hello, darlings. Um, so, uh, okay. So today, no, wait, let me get the announcements out first. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up and all of the therapists in your area will be there. Also the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA or any other goddamn therapist for that matter. Thanks for playing, bye-bye, boom. All right, shakalaka. Anyway, there it is. Okay, so announcements. Um, the next tour is going to be in Santa Barbara. Um, and it'll be July 6th. If you're interested in that, go to Eventbrite, sign up for that. The one after that is 18th. If you're interested in that, go to Eventbrite, sign up for that. If I do not get enough people signing up for the St. Paul, Minnesota one, St. Paul, Minneapolis one, I'm going to have to cancel because I need enough to at least cover my airplane out there. So go to Eventbrite, sign up for it. Um, also, there are new uh, cabins available for the cruise on December 6th. So if you're interested in joining us on the cruise, go to Eventbrite. We need to cruise with Chris Godinas. Go sign up for that. It'll be awesome. We're going to have a great time. I am so looking forward to that. I can't even begin to tell you. Anyway, hi guys. All right. So today's topic is victim or victorious, leaving the comfort zone. So what I see a lot of is that when we have been abused, oh, oh, and also if you guys have got questions, put question and then type your question because I've got John and Chris and Susan all trying to get questions to me. So they're having to do it through Facebook to get it to me because I can't see it when it's coming up. So, um, okay. So victim or victorious. So the thing that happens to us when we get out of an abusive relationship is that we get stuck in the victim mode and you don't want to get stuck in the victim mode. You do not want to unpack your bags there. Now, have we been victimized? Fuck yeah, we have. Absolutely. But you do not want to unpack your bags there. But what happens is, is that we get stuck in that. They did this to me. They did this to me. They did this to me. Well, yes, they did. abso freaking lutely But the question you have to ask yourself is what is the next step? How do we get out of this? How do we move forward. What do we do to get out of victim mode and into action mode? Victim is passive. Victim is when we sit there and we go, it was done to me. It was done to me. They're horrible, terrible, awful, terrible people. It was done to me. It was done to me. And it's true. They are terrible, horrible, awful people. They did do it to us. Absolutely. But if you stay stuck in victim mode, those mofos win and you do not want to allow that. So victim or victorious. It's really a question of, are you ready to move forward? So it is perfectly okay to write things out, be angry at your abuser, be angry what they did to you. Absolutely, do not unpack your bags there. And we need to leave our comfort zone because living in that, you know, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I've been victimized is kind of comfortable because then what? What, do we, what happens when we step out of that? Who do we become? Because we have somehow defined ourselves by what our abuser did to us. So you do not want to do that. We, we, <laughs> we are so much greater, so much bigger, so much better than what our abusers are. So why in the world would we allow ourselves to be defined by what they did to us? You, you, you don't want that, trust me on that one. So when we are healing from abuse, it really means that we're gonna be stepping out of our comfort zone. I'm gonna take my shoes off, I'm getting hot here, hang on. It's about, you know, ooh, 85 degrees and like almost 100% humidity. Um, so anyway, you wanna get out of the victim mode. You do not wanna stay in what they did to us. Yes, what they did to us was horrible. Absolutely. Don't ever forget it. I'm not saying forget it. Oh, hail to the no. You want to remember what they did so that you don't get into another one or so that you do not go back to them. Absolutely. So the thing of it is, is that the next step is scary because now we're not allowing them to define us anymore. And what have these abusers done? What is the main thing that an abuser does? They control. They control, they manipulate, they lie, and they use that lying manipulation and control on us. And we get used to, comfortable with, 
being lied to, being manipulated, and being controlled. So once we step out of that and we start, start taking charge of our own life, who are we? Who are we? Who are we separate from the abuser? Who are we separate from the abuse that we went through? And that's a scary thought. I mean, think about it. We are creatures of habit and we hate change. We do, we do, we do, we do. And especially when we have been in, in an abusive relationship, we are addicted to the abuser like nobody's business. And we don't like change. It's frightening to us. Even good change can be frightening. So it's reframing the way you think about the world, the way you think about you. So it's stepping out of I'm a victim, I'm a victim, and fearing change. You know, it's like, oh my God, this is new, this is different, I don't like it, right? And stepping into, oh, wow, let's reframe this, okay? This is new, this is different, it feels a little funky, I'm not sure, but it sure as hell is a lot better than being abused by my abuser. So it's really a matter of stepping out of the old way of thinking and stepping into the new way of thinking. When we're with an abuser, they have this insane ability to make beautiful things ugly. They do. They're negative, 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 negative all the time. And so they really hate change because change means that they have to change. To a healthy person, change means that, oh, I get to change. I get to. I get to change. Not I have to change. You don't have to. You don't have to do anything. You can stay stuck in victimhood if you want. You're not gonna go very far, but you get to change. So it's changing the way we say things to ourselves about the world and about our recovery, because it really is a recovery. So in my practice, I do not allow my clients to stay stuck in victimhood. I don't, because they're not ever gonna get better. They're just gonna stay stuck and they're gonna stay unhappy and they're gonna stay continuing to relive and relive and relive the trauma. So what I do with them is I allow them to express, I allow them to vocalize all of the horrible things that happened to them. And then after hmm, two, three sessions, and sometimes even after not even in two or three sessions, sometimes in the middle of the first session, I'll be like, okay, stop, stop. This is not serving you. How is this moving you forward? How is this helping you heal? So especially if they've told their story over and over and over and over and over and over. And I mean, that's great. We do need to tell our stories. I don't want you guys to confuse this with victim blaming, certainly not victim blaming. So the difference between victim blaming and moving forward out of the victim mentality, victim blaming is like when people look at a rape victim and go, you wanted this, you did this, you created this. Okay. That's victim blaming. Victim mentality is where things happen to us, but we keep reliving them and we keep stuck in the I'm a victim thoughts, okay? You've got to get those thoughts out of your head. You want to move forward? You're not a victim, babies. You are survivors. You are kick-ass, take-no-prisoners survivors. We do not deal or negotiate with terrorists, okay? Abusers are terrorists. So think of it that way. You're a warrior. You're a warrior. And warriors do not stay stuck in victim mode. If they stay stuck in victim mode in the middle of battle, they're going to get killed. So we need to start moving ourselves into warrior mode. We need to start moving ourselves into ch change is good. So reframing, reframing the way we think about everything. Did stuff happen to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Write it down, put it somewhere where you can see it. But stop acting as if it were still occurring. So this is client, family, friends, lover, whatever, has harmed them and they get stuck in the story. They get stuck in the story. Do not get stuck in the story. You can change your story at any time. It takes wanting to. That's really, it's a desire to change. It's a desire to change. It's a desire to move forward and it's willing to look fear in the face and tell it to go fuck itself sideways with an unlubricated baseball bat, preferably one with splinters. And that takes courage. And listen to me now, believe me later, you guys are the most courageous people on the face of the fucking planet because surviving abuse, surviving that kind of damage, coming out on the other side and being able to tell your story and help others, that's brave. You guys are amazing. Don't allow yourself to be trapped in the mindset of the abuser. 
Abusers are very black and white thinking. All, nothing, good, bad, black, white. They do not have plasticity. They, they don't have the ability to move, to flow, to you know have that ability to change course. We do, we do, because we have empathy. And we have a burgeoning knowledge of who we are, who they are, and self-esteem, self-love. Getting rid of the disease to please, getting rid of the need to heal others when we are not taking care of ourselves. So the victim mentality is learned. It is absolutely learned. It goes along with um, learned helplessness. So what I also see in a lot of survivors of abuse is this learned helplessness. I can't, I can't, it's too hard. I can't, it's too much. I can't, I'm overwhelmed. Okay, here's the deal. You need to get can't out of your vocabulary. It's not a matter of can't, it's a matter of won't. So when we are healing, it is super important to pay attention to how we say things to ourselves. Because if we tell ourselves that we're a victim, guess what? We're gonna act like a victim. If we tell ourselves we can't, then we're not gonna be able to because our subconscious listens to everything that we say to ourselves. And if our dialogue, if our internal critic, if our internal dialogue is not healthy, it's going to be a series of, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I can't, I can't, I can't, it's too much, I'm overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be careful of what you are telling yourself. Garbage in, garbage out, garbage in, garbage out. If you're feeding your head garbage, garbage is going to come out. It is. And that's why the positive affirmations are so ridiculously important. Because if we do not do those positive affirmations, if we do not do the uh, acknowledgements of how far we've come, guys, if you've left an abuser, holy shit, props, man, props. Because that takes courage, that takes bravery, that takes an insane amount of self-preservation, okay? Or if you're even thinking of leaving an abuser, great job, you're on the right path, absolutely. But then the next step is once you are out, you have to change the thoughts. You have got to change the thoughts that kept you stuck in that relationship for however long you were in that relationship. So you have to be careful and mindful. It is all about mindfulness. Stepping out of the victim role and stepping into the victorious role is all about mindfulness. So being mindful, did this happen? Yes. Is it going to define me? No, I choose not to. I choose not to let that define me. It is a choice. It is apt to call the way ambulance. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but it's like if I allow them to continue that train of thought, they will never get better, never. So you have to be willing to go, yes, I was victimized. Yes, I was harmed. Yes, this person's a fucking asshole. But I choose, I choose to not allow them to define who I am. Am. I get to figure out who the hell I am, separate from them. I get to be successful. These are all these positive affirmations. It's okay for me to be successful. It's okay for me to love myself. It's okay for me to not fix the entire world. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You give yourself permission. So it really is working with the internal dialogue, the internal critic. And it's working with the basic assumptions that we have about who we are in the universe. Interesting, I'm doing this in Thailand. So <laughs> yesterday we were at all of the temples, right? We went and saw the reclining Buddha and all of that. And as we were walking through the complex, it was very quiet, it was very peaceful. There was this serenity there. And I was like, ah, wow, this is nice. And we walked through pretty much in silence until we got to the main temple area. And shutting down that critic is what I noticed. It was like being able to be in this moment, right here, right now, and not in my head, and not thinking about the future, and not worrying about the past, and not doing the what if thing. That really said to me, this is mindfulness. This is mindfulness, being in the actual moment, taking charge of who I am, and what I want, and where I'm going. That is mindfulness. That is all a part of mindfulness. So when we get stuck in the learned helplessness, that is something we either learn from our family of origin, which I can't use my other hand because I'm holding the phone, but you know, family of origin. So, and when you, <laughs> John's like, you want me to hold the phone? Um, hold the phone, John. No. Um, so um, that's something we learn from our family of origin. And that is 
part of the people pleasing thing because sometimes, not always, but sometimes we get our self esteem from being victim. Mm, think about it. If we had narcissistic parents, okay, if we had very narcissistic parents, were they happy for us when we were successful or were they more happy when we failed? Think about it. Think about it. Nine times out of 10, when I have clients sitting on my couch, they tell me how their abusive parents would be thrilled when they failed, but be very cold and nasty when they succeeded. So we get the message as a little kid, it's not okay to succeed. So this is all the stuff that you have to un do get rid of the learned helplessness so I, I hate to say this is something else I do with my clients when they go oh I'm trying oh I'm trying oh it's so hard so I had this one client teenager came in and everything was hard everything was hard everything it's like getting up in the morning hard going to school hard everything was hard and they would say that oh it's so hard it's so hard and I said okay I, I hear you I hear you think that it's hard however are you aware that you're creating it being hard and they kind of looked at me and they were like, what do you mean? And then we talked about how we think it is how it turns out. And then I said, I challenge you. I give you a challenge. You go two weeks without saying it's hard and let's see how hard life really is. And they did and they came back and they were like, I cannot believe it, you're right. And I was like, yeah, I am. So changing the way we think really changes our lives. And if we don't be mindful about how we say things to ourselves, how we present the world to ourselves, we will start looking at the world through the eyes of our abuser. And you do not want that because those motherfuckers will win. Don't let them win. The whole thing is about not letting them win and you growing and you being okay and you living in the, pro, pro, the present moment. So, um, okay. And then, okay. So try, let's talk about the word try and can't. Okay. Try and can't. So right now, I'm trying to jog. N notice it's, it's not happening. That's what the word try means. Try doesn't mean doing. Try, try means trying, which means not doing. So here's my lousy Yoda impersonation. Hold on. Yeah, everybody's smiling, shut up. Um, so in the original Star Wars, the best three movies, thank you very much, because the other ones were crap, except for the newer ones. I liked Rogue One, that was a good one. But um, okay, in the original Star Wars, okay, Luke is on Dagobah and Yoda is trying to teach him the force and all of that stuff. And his, his cruiser has sunk into the, to the swamp, right? And so he's trying, he's trying to raise it up and he turns to Yoda and he goes, it's too hard. I can't. He's whiny. Oh my God. Whiny, whiny Luke. Anyway, so he, he can't do it. So Yoda just gets disgusted with him and, and raises his up, you know, raises those, the cruiser up, no problem. And then looks at him and goes, mm, do or do not, there is no try. So that's the thing, there is no try. You're either doing it or you're not. If you're trying, that means you're not doing it. So stop trying and do it. So you gotta get rid of the words try and can't. Can't is a choice. It's a choice. Yeah, you can, you can do this. Are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to step out of the parameters that your abuser have put you in, whether that was a parent, whether that was a friend, whether that was a boss, whether that was a romantic partner, are you willing to step out of learned helplessness? Are you willing to be better than them? I think you should. Just to piss them right the fuck off. Do it, do it. It'd be awesome. So that's the whole thing. Can't is a choice. Can't is a choice. Won't is really what it is. You know, it's, it's not that you can't, it's that you won't. So for example, I won't go bungee jumping. That is never gonna happen. I see no reason to jump off of a bridge. I really don't for any reason, even if I'm attached to a cord, no thank you. Probably not gonna go skydiving either. And that's a choice, you know, unless of course the plane is going down, in which case, yeah, hell yeah, I'll strap on a parachute and jump out. But the point being is I won't do that. And it's a choice, I do I wanted to, but I won't, because I don't want to. So can't, is bullshit. And that's one of the first things we learn in therapy. That's also one of the first things we learn in AA. It's like, no, it's won't, and either you're doing it or you're not. So step out of the learned helplessness. Step out of the learned behavior where it says, no, 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 you can't. No, 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 you're trying. No, you're either doing it or you're not. And that pisses off a lot of survivors initially because bada bing, bada boom, 
our recovery is on ourselves. It is. Nobody's going to do it for us. There is no knight, white knight in shining armor going to come marching in and save us. Not a therapist is going to do that. Not a friend is going to do that. Not a family member. Not our abusers. We have to save ourselves. And that means we have to be very, very mindful of what we are telling ourselves on a second to second basis. Are we playing the abuser's game or are we stepping out of that and taking charge of our own recovery and taking charge of our own life and refusing to allow the abuser to continue to abuse us even though they're not there. Now here's something trippy. So what ends up happening is, is when we step out of an abusive relationship and we get into safety and we get into recovery, our abuser is still in our head. We have incorporated their bullshit into our line of thinking. Because remember, abusers' whole goal is to make us mini-me's of them. Because they're narcissists, because they need to have themselves their back to them. And so we start incorporating what they say, what they think, what they like, what they don't like. And that is why when we get out of an abusive relationship, oftentimes, the survivors look at me and they go, I don't know who I am. I, I, I have no clue. I have no clue what I like. I couldn't even tell you what my favorite color was. And that's sad. That is really sad that we have been brainwashed to the point where we no longer know who we are, what we are, what we like, what we want to do, what, what, what do we do for fun? That's one of the things I ask people when they sit on my couch. It's like, okay, what do you like to do for fun? And oftentimes they'll look at me and go, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what I like to do for fun because they've forgotten who they are because the abuser has gotten into their head, literally taken a, an egg scrambler and gone and scrambled our brains. That's what they do because they want us to become them. So if you find yourself molding yourself to become the abuser, you're not gonna remember who you are. Super important to get back to what you used to love to do. What did you love to do? What was your favorite hobby? What was your favorite food? What was your favorite color? What are the things that made you you? Because I can guarantee you the abuser will have done everything they can to try to strip that away from you and make you them. That's what they do. So taking your power back, oh, I'm gonna switch arms because my arm's going to sleep, oh my God. Um, so taking your power back means that you become you, that you take care of you, that you figure out who you were prior to the abuser. What did you love? When was the last time you flew a kite? When was the last time you stepped out of your comfort zone? And this is what this whole thing is about. We become comfortable with the victimization. We become comfortable with the being told who we are and what we want and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That does not mean that we like it. That does not mean that we need to keep doing it. It's just that if we've been in an abusive relationship, we become comfortable and we need to eventually step out of our comfort zone and do something different. And to us, that can be very terrifying. So how do we deal with the anger and the fear? So anger is the bodyguard of the softer emotions. Anger is the bodyguard of fear. Anger is the bodyguard of hurt. So if you're feeling angry about having to change or having to be mindful or any of that, the question is, what is the fear? So always ask yourself when you feel anger, what is the fear? What is fearful for you? What is going on? How is this change going to affect you? How are you feeling about saying no to victimhood? How do you feel about taking charge of your life? How do you feel about, you know, maybe changing the negative thoughts into the positive thoughts? You know, how does it feel? And where is the fear? What's the worst case scenario? So the other thing that I do, oh, switching hands again, sorry. Um, the other thing that I do is I encourage my clients to do a disaster report. Well, okay, so you've got some fear. Let's do a disaster report. What is the absolute worst that can happen? And usually it's nothing. It's nothing. There is really, you know, once we get those out of our head and either vocalize them or we write them out on paper, those fears tend to disappear like dew on a summer's day, you know, especially if you're in Arizona. However, the dew here, I'm pretty sure is still sticking around because it's about 95% humidity. Oh my God. Anyway, the point being is, is that you got to get it out of your head, either vocalizing it or writing it down. Because once we get it out of our head, it's no longer, oh, there is a storm coming in. Um, it's no longer because the wind's blowing, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's going to be wet today. Um, it's no longer rambling around in the back of our heads. And we tend to 
don't know if you guys have ever tried oysters. I don't like oysters, they're gross. But when I first tried oysters, I made the mistake of trying to chew them instead of just swallowing them, because yuck. Anyway, and as I chewed it, it just got bigger and nastier and grosser. And that's what happens with our thoughts. They just get bigger and nastier and grosser. So that's why it's important to vocalize. What is your worst case scenario? What is the absolute worst that can happen? You know, and then challenge it. You challenge it. How reasonable is this? How likely is this to happen? Okay, and that's what you have to do. Because if you don't, the fear will just be like a bully. And it will be like, ha, 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 I own you, I run you, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna keep, you know, bugging you and I'm gonna tell you how terrible things could be and blah, 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 blah. And if we listen to that voice instead of the voice that says, okay, thank you for your input, shut the fuck up. If we listen to that voice instead of the positive one, we will never do anything with our lives. Never. Never. So what we'll do is we'll just sit around and be afraid of everything. And that agoraphobia and this is a lot of targets of abuse because they get stuck in the victim mentality as opposed to moving into the victorious mentality which is yeah this stuff happened to me Ooh, it's getting windy holy cow there now you know Ooh, I bet it's gonna rain soon um, anyway we get stuck into the um, there's more questions coming in um, we get stuck into the um, it's all good okay just checking just checking just checking the checkage um, we get stuck into the victim mentality as opposed to the victorious Victorious mentality, which is stepping into ownership of who we are and basically thumbing our nose at our at our abuser and going, hey, you know, you gave me all this fear, I'm handing it back to you. No, thank you. You gave me all this anger, I'm handing it back to you. No, thank you. I don't have to accept it. I don't. So anyway, that is pretty much in a nutshell what I wanted to talk about. Be very careful of, am I still on? I don't know. Are you still on? I don't know. Okay, so where was I? Um, so it's it's a question of, you know, stepping out of the, I can't, it's too hard, it's too overwhelming, it's too much kind of thing. Is this hard? Yes. Is it overwhelming? You bet. Um, is it too much? Yeah, it can be on occasion. You acknowledge it, but then you push through it. You do not unpack your bags in, I can't. You do not unpack your bags in, I'm trying. Because if you unpack your bags there, guys, and you set up shop there, that's where you're gonna stay stuck. And you're not gonna move forward to be the best version of who you are. And who you are is way better than that. Don't allow yourself to be stuck in I can't. Don't allow yourself to be stuck in I'm trying because you're better than I'm trying and you're better than I can't. Because I know you can and you can do it. You can do it. I've seen you. It's awesome. And what I really think is awesome is when I see you guys on, you know, in the chat here or, you know, because I look at it afterwards, um, or in, you know, the comments afterwards, supporting each other. That is fantastic but I want to give you guys a warning be very careful of armchair psychologists that are kind of like uh, you know giving an approval to narcissism because they do infiltrate these sites they do and they try to mess with people's minds don't let them and that's very important um, so anyway what I want to say is you can move forward from this you can got to do actions speak louder than words. So it's one thing to say, I want to be healthy. I want to move forward. I want to step out of victimhood. But then the next step is actually doing. So what is it that the next step is? It's giving yourself permission. I give myself permission to be successful. I give myself permission to be alone and work on myself for an entire year. I give myself permission to get the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi or the disease to please by Harriet Brager or any of the books and take your time and work on you. You get to work on you because you're worth it you're worth it no matter what your abuser has told you no matter whether it was a parental unit or a boss or a loved one or a romantic partner or whatever you are worth your own time love and attention and you can do it you absolutely can and don't let anybody stop you you absolutely can do it I have faith in you. Look, guys, you know, I've been there, done that. If you read my book, um, What's Wrong With Your Dad, you know that I've gone through the same exact thing. So, and of course, I work with victims of domestic violence or targets of domestic violence. So, and it's really important to not identify yourself as a victim. It's like you were targeted. They targeted us as surely as a panther targets its prey. So, because they wanted what we had. They wanted our love, they wanted our light, they wanted our empathy, they wanted who we are. Okay, we are at the half an hour mark. I'm going to start taking questions. So, Mr. Godinez, can you read it to me? Yeah, read it to me and then I'll say it out loud. I miss my mother, mm -hmm. even though she's a narcissist. Okay, I miss my mother, even though she's a narcissist. She refuses counseling. 
She refuses counseling. Unless it's one of her friends. Unless it's one of her friends. Should I try to rebuild our relationship? Should I try to rebuild the relationship? If your mother is a narcissist and refuses counseling, listen to me now, believe me later. You do not want to be going to counseling with a narcissist ever. I don't care if it's a, a friend. I don't care if it's a partner. I don't care if it's a boss. I don't care if it's a romantic relationship or parent. Because what the narcissist will do is you will go to counseling in good faith. You will go there saying, hey, I want to fix this relationship. Hey, I want to repair this. Hey, I want this to be better. And what they will do is they will take anything and everything that you have said. And then at a later date, they will flip it around on you, which is what narcissists do. And they will throw it against you and they will twist your words and they will make you feel like you are the cray cray one and you are not the cray cray one. So you never, ever, 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 ever on any planet want to go to counseling with a narcissist. They will harm you. They will harm you. So I hope that answered the question. Next. I'm so angry at the people who have hurt me. I'm so angry at the people who have hurt me. And myself for letting them. And myself for letting them. How do I get rid of that? Okay, so anger again is the bodyguard of hurt and is the bodyguard of sadness. So the really important thing is to get it out. Write it out. Get it out of your head. Get it onto paper. You need to forgive yourself. Listen, guys, if somebody had taught us when we were kids how to avoid a narcissist, none of us would be in a narcissistic relationship or an abusive relationship. They don't. And some of us came from families that were completely batshit crazy, okay? So we didn't have the chance to know what healthy was. So when we get into a narcissist, they are very, very uh, manipulative. They can fool in counselors, okay? Forgive yourself for the love of it and all that is holy. Forgive yourself. You could not know what was going to happen. You couldn't. Because either we came from a family where we were groomed to just accept that, or the narcissist was so psychotic that they were manipulative and able to make us believe their bullshit. So forgive yourself. Forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness is about us. Think about it. Are you going to damn a five-year-old for being dropped in the middle of Iceland and not speaking Icelandish unless they were Icelandish to begin with? No, you're not. So why are you damn? yourself for not seeing what the abuser was until it became blatantly obvious because we don't we're not trained in that we're not and remember they can fool a lot of really good therapists so there's that okay is that it those are the only two questions no I saw a whole bunch of questions going by okay go into the chat that's what I was saying go into the chat because I know that there were more questions okay questions once we were told we have CPTSD how do we know for sure we don't have borderline personality it um, is it Okay, here's the reason why. Borderline personality disorder is rooted, rooted in trauma. So CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Complex meaning it happens over and over and over. Post, after the fact, traumatic, it was a terrible event that happened over and over and over. Um, disorder, not handling it well. Anxiety, not handling it well. So it can get misdiagnosed as as borderline because they are very similar to each other. So when you are going in and talking to a therapist, if that therapist is not well versed in, um, in trauma, they will often misdiagnose, you know, and, and borderlines get labeled borderline when really what the therapist should be doing is addressing the trauma. What was the trauma? What was the trauma that created the borderline maladaptive behavior? So basically with a borderline, there is an intense fear of abandonment. That is their biggest fear in life is being abandoned. So they will either preemptively ab abandon people in order to keep themselves from being abandoned, or they adapt these really maladaptive behaviors, raging, which is very much like a narcissist, raging, Aging, uh, manipulation, uh, crying, uh, self-harm, etc., in an attempt to not be abandoned. So it's really important that you um, that you uh, figure out what the trauma is. And if this person is not addressing the tra trauma, then they're not going to do you any justice, even if it is borderline. Okay, because they get it, and they need to get to the root. What is the trauma? What happened? What caused the trauma? What caused the issue? Question: Is it also victim mentality when a person who suffers from depression says it's too hard to get up in the morning? Okay, no. So clinical depression. Let's talk about the difference. Clinical depression is different from situational depression. Situational depression is a loss of any kind. A loss of any kind. So. Um, 
the okay you have questions okay good um so a loss of any kind so that means um a divorce a death of a pet death of a, a loved one um moving to a new city uh, loss of physicality a disability things like that so we can become depressed now situational depression means okay it's it's a situation it will get better okay clinical depression in was when it lasts and it, it doesn't go away and the person does not get out of bed they don't do the, the things that they used to love to do. They don't take care of themselves. They don't bathe. They don't eat right. That is clinical depression. And at that point in time, you need to be speaking to a psychiatrist and probably get on mood stabilizers. What's happening is, is that the brain is unable to produce the correct amount of serotonin, dopamine, and nor norepinephrines, et cetera, that, that are feel-good chemicals. And if we stay stuck in that, it just stops producing it for whatever reason. So it's it's really important get to a psychiatrist either a naturopathic psychiatrist or a you know farm farm psychiatrist farm a big farm uh, and get onto a mood stabilizer because that that's dangerous to not be able to get out of bed no that is not living in victim that is there's something going on and there's depression going on so if the person is unable to pull themselves out of it then you need to definitely suggest that they go speak to a psychiatrist okay next question I was accused of emotional cheating when spending time at home Okay, I was accused of emotional cheating when what? Spending time on my phone. Spending time, when spending time on my phone. Watching the news or your show. Watching the news or my show. Okay. What is an emotional affair anyway? Is it cheating? Okay, an emotional affair is when you are doing things that you should not be doing if you're with somebody. So in other words, if you can't tell your spouse about it, that's probably an emotional affair. Okay. Um, spending time on your phone is not an emotional affair. Now, if you're spending time on your phone to avoid your partner, then yeah, that's, that's not an emotional affair. That, that means that there's something wrong with the relationship. So the thing about narcissists, the thing about borderlines is that they're very, very, very insecure and they are very jealous of anything, including a phone. So remember, they get jealous when uh, you're paying attention to your friends, when you're paying attention to your pet, when you're paying attention to your children, when you're paying attention to your job, anything like that, they get very, very jealous. And that's not normal. I mean, it's it's normal to be on the phone and check stuff and do things like that. But if you're in a relationship, you should, put, should be putting your phone down and actually speaking to your significant other. So um, that's, that's not normal, being jealous of that that is not normal or about now caveat the narcissist will twist that and they will go well who were you talking to and it was your friend well you shouldn't be talking to them you shouldn't be talking to them blah 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 and then you start getting the idea oh i shouldn't be telling them when i'm talking to them that's different if you guys are not talking about anything that's you know sexual or hinky or anything like that you should be able to speak to your friends so if they're trying to isolate you which is what abusers do then you need to take a look at why you're in this relationship. And honestly, a healthy relationship, there is no issues like this. There is no, you know, you're on the phone, what are you looking at, who are you, who are you talking to, blah, blah, blah. So remember, abusers constantly project what they are thinking, what they are doing onto us. So if they're accusing you of cheating all the time, you may wanna take a look at that. Okay, next question. Why do I keep attracting partners like my narcissistic mother? How do I change that? Okay, why do I keep attracting partners like my narcissistic mother? How do I change that? You've got to address the inner child. So when we are raised by a parental unit that is dysfunctional, our inner child is constantly looking to fix that original wound. And what we do is, in our little inner child's mind, we look outside of ourselves and we go, ah, this person reminds me of my mom or my dad or my uncle or my boss or whatever, whoever, you know, and if I can make them love me, I will pro prove that parent wrong. It's never going to work because that's half of a shit sandwich, half of a shit sandwich, pfft, total shit sandwich. You don't want a shit sandwich. Trust me on that. So the way to start working on that is figure out why you are continuing to try to fix this original wound with these people. So you wanna get with a damn good therapist, you wanna work on trauma, you wanna work on original wound, you wanna work on inner child work. So the Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor is awesome. The other one that I really like is um, uh, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. That's another really great one. So those are the two that you wanna be getting to work on that. And John's shaking his head, yes, going, yes, those will work. He's doing them also. So yeah, and I recommend it to anyone who has had a narcissistic parent or an abusive parent or a parent who was just completely batshimomo crazy. So next question. At what 
what age would you tell a kid that their parent is gaslighting them? At what age would you tell a kid their parent is gaslighting them? Okay. I would say adult. Um, what you can do is, and you've got to be very careful about this, guys. You've got to be very careful about this. And maybe that's a, a one that I need to be doing for another episode is, uh, again, revisiting custody battles with a high-conflict divorce. So when you are dealing with a high-conflict divorce, you want to be very careful about not alienating those children. Now, it's a fine line. If you know the person is abusive, you clearly don't want your kids with them, but proving that they're crazy, proving that they're harmful to the child is very difficult and it would require a psych eval. So what you can do is when the other parent lies, you can point it out. It's like, hmm, okay, well, so he's saying this and here's the truth, so hmm, that's interesting. And you leave it up to the kid, but you make it very clear that it's a lie going on. But you wanna be very careful about labeling things and you wanna be very careful about parental alienation. See, not all court systems get it. Not all therapists get it, unfortunately. Somebody help me. Anyway, so you've gotta be careful about that because you don't want the court to come back and go, you're alienating, you're the problem, you, 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 when in fact it's them, 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 them. So, and then when they're an adult, the courts have nothing to do with it and you can take them out for coffee and have a sit down with them and tell them the truth. You know, and, and that's really what you can and cannot do because you've gotta be very careful, you gotta walk that line. Now, if you can prove that that the other parent is completely insane and should not have custody of the kids because they're doing dangerous things. Say, for example, they're an addict, they're using, they're abusive, they've hit them, you know, things like that. You go and you get a psych eval done on the entire family and then you have the, the therapist, whatever, present in court their findings. So, and it's expensive and it sucks. And I wish that we had a better system, but we don't. So, hope that answered the question. Yeah, next. When abuse started as a baby, can we just have only CPS, TSD, or is it more often the person develops more conditions? Okay, when we've been abused since childhood, since when we've been abused since baby, babyness, is it possible that we only have CPTSD or could we develop a whole bunch of other things? You can develop a whole bunch of other things, unfortunately. And it's really, again, it's gonna be dealing with that root trauma. So you gotta get that handled first and then you deal with whatever else is going on. You can have depression, you can have anxiety, you can have all sorts of things. You can have personality disorders and trauma and this and that. There can be multiple things going on. That does not mean that you cannot heal from it. What it means is, is you need to handle the trauma first because if you don't get that inner child handled, if you don't get them comfortable, if you don't get them uh, safe, if you don't get them secure, they're going to keep running the show and they're gonna keep giving you the message that you need to be with abusers and that's not what you want, trust me on that one. So yeah, get with a good therapist and really a trauma therapist and work on the trauma first and then work on whatever else is going on. Okay, next question. Is there a reason my partner would start hanging out with toxic friends? Does CPTSD cause someone to recreate abuse? Yes, okay, hold on. <laughs> is there a reason that my partner would start hanging out with toxic friends? Would start hanging out with toxic friends? Does CPTSD does CPTSD cause somebody to recreate abuse? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. The inner child recreates the family situation. That's why we look for people that remind us of mom, dad, grandparents, caregivers, whoever were abusive to us. So, because we're trying to heal it, we're trying to fix it. And so we recreate that family situation because it's comfortable, because it's the devil we know. That's what I'm trying to say. We've got to step out of the comfort zone. We've got to go into the unknown. We have to take that leap of faith into the void, knowing that our parachute's going to open. We have to, because if we don't, we keep doing a, a, a Groundhog Day over and over and over again, except this time it doesn't have Bill Murray and it sucks. So you want to make sure that you get out of the comfort zone and you do something different. So yes, CPTSD does create us looking for the same thing over and over and over again because we're desperately trying to fix this as opposed to, you know, be having fixed this on our own. We keep looking outside of ourselves and we have to work on ourselves. It's not gonna come from outside. So yes, we do keep looking for people that remind us of the original abuser. Okay, next question. My ex moved in right after divorce with a gal and her kids. Okay, my ex moved in right after our divorce with a gal and her kids. Now my sons are going to help with remodeling their place. Now the sons are going to help with remodeling their place. Should I let it go or question? Okay, well, so how do the sons feel about it? 
you know, really ask the kids, are they okay with it or are they not? It really is what is best for the child and how does the child feel about it? The kids get overlooked in the divorce proceedings because the divorce proceedings are so emotional and so highly charged that we forget to ask. Ask them, talk to them. Do they want to help with the remodeling? If they don't, then it's an issue. If they do, let it go, you know? And I think the fear is for a lot of parents is that when the children start interacting with the new partner or the new, you know, the new family unit or whatever, but if you've got a good relationship with your kids, they'll know it and they'll always come back. It may take a few years, but they will. So ask the kids, are they comfortable with this or not? And if they're not, then it needs to be addressed. So there's that. Okay, so, all right, do we have any more questions at all? Okay, so, wait. How do you tell your story without sounding like you were angry and holding a grudge? Okay, so here's the deal. You are angry and you are holding a grudge. And anybody who does not understand that can go fuck themselves sideways. Oh, sorry, the question. <laughs> How do I tell my story without sounding angry and holding a grudge? So you tell your story because you are angry and you are holding a grudge because these people have harmed us, absolutely. So, you know, it doesn't matter what other people think. It really doesn't, it's your story. It is, and in the beginning, yes, when we are telling our stories, it is really like, God damn it, they hurt me, they harmed me, how dare they? And that's that's your truth, and that's okay. And if people don't understand that or don't like that, you refer them to either my book, You Can Lead a Horse to Water But You Can't Make Them Cha-Cha, available on Amazon, shameless plug, or you can get them to Raquel Lerner's book, which is The Object of My Affection is in My Reflection, Coping with a Narcissist. That's a great book. The other one is Stop Walking on Eggshells by Randy Krieger. These experiences that we go through are universal for victims of targets of abusers. Universal. And healthy people don't understand it because they haven't had the grooming, they haven't had the abuse, they haven't dealt with somebody who is that malignant. And either they'll get it or they won't. And if they won't, then they are not your friends. So don't be afraid of telling your story. Absolutely, do not be afraid of telling your story. People are gonna accept it or not. You know, some people have read my book, um, What's Wrong With Your Dad, also available on Amazon and Audible. Um, and they were like, oh, you know, you're just being vindictive, you're just being this, you're just being that. And I'm like, no, I'm telling my story because this, what happened to me, happens to every single abuse victim. Every single one, the gaslighting, the lying, the manipulation, the self-esteem issues, the, the fear, the throwing up, the, you know, the whole thing. It's like everybody goes through it. And the more targets of abuse speak up about what they went through, the more other targets of abuse go, holy shit, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. There are more of us out there. Oh my God, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one who went through that. And that, my friends, is huge, which is why I love this community because you guys help each other and you let each other know you're not alone. So no, not everybody's gonna understand our story. Not everybody's gonna accept our story. And if they don't, okay, well, they're not part of your tribe. Get rid of them. There you go. Next question. Um, how would you know if someone is being, super, is being romantic and super interested in you or just love bombing? Okay, how do you know the difference between love bombing and somebody who is really interested in you? Okay. Okay, here's the deal. Love bombers bomb, as in they go over the top, over the top, and they want to be with you 24 seven. They don't allow you time to breathe. They don't allow you time to be alone. You see each other on the weekends or whenever you have time, right? With a love bomber, they're gonna demand your time and attention 24 seven, 24 seven, and they will text, 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 and expect you to text back, or they'll call, 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 and expect you to call back. That's not normal, guys. That's not normal. And they move the relationship along at a very, very fast pace. So anybody who's pushing within a month to be your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're with an abuser. Garen fucking to it. And if they're pushing to move in within three months to a year, they're an abuser. You gotta take your time, guys. You really have to take your time and you have to ask questions. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your mom. Tell me about your past. Tell me about, because the thing of it is, is that abusers tell on themselves. They're not as smart as they like to think they are, which thank God, because we'd be in real trouble if they were. So what they do is, is that they will say things like, oh, every ex I've ever dated was crazy. They, oh my, all my exes are, all my exes are crazy. Really? That's kind of interesting. Or they will, you know, and this is different from somebody who keeps attracting a narc, okay? This is like the narc's point of view. So that what they do is they pretend to be us. They pretend to be us, remember that. So they do that, or they talk about the, the family 
and it's it's either too perfect or they are really bagging on their parent of the opposite sex. So you wanna watch for all of that. So a normal healthy relationship takes time. You take your time. You do not rush into things. John and I dated for two years platonically before we started anything romantic. And then we waited another two years after that before he asked me to marry him. And I was fine with that because I got to know his family and I got to know his sister and I got to know all the nieces and nephews and uh, everything like that. And that's important. You need to know the family of origin. If they never want to introduce you to your family, Houston, there's a problem. So it takes time. It takes time. So take your time. You're not in a hurry. You're not. You're not. Take your time. Get to know each other. Go slow. And Love Bomber is the one who does these grand gestures immediately and who pushes, 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 pushes. It's got to happen now. Got to happen now. Got to happen now. Got to happen now. And they're the ones that push for marriage. They're the ones that push to move in. They're the ones that do all of that. So anyway, next question. I hope that answered your question. How do I help my teenage kids set boundaries against the abusive tactics of their BPD dad when they're with them? Okay, how do I help my teenage kids set boundaries against, when, the, abusive against the abusive tactics of their uh, borderline dad? So really what it is is self-esteem um, and boundaries. And honestly, if your court custody allows, get them into a counselor get them into a counselor that can help them set boundaries and do it. Because the thing of it is, is if they're seeing a counselor, there's another set of eyes on it. And if the counselor is the one recommending boundaries and saying no and discussing what's going on in the home, it's no longer just you. Because any suggestions you come up with, the dad is immediately going to, or the mom, whoever the the abuser is, is going to immediately dismiss them and go, oh, this is this person just trying to control me and blah, 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 blah. So what you want to do is you want to get the kids into a counselor. You absolutely do. Now, here's the thing. In the custody uh, uh, agreement, you've got to make sure that you've got the right to do that because people forget that. will either demand that the kids see a counselor they've picked, which generally means a counselor that doesn't know diddly frickin' squat about abuse or BPD or narcissism or anything, or they pick somebody that's fresh out of school. You know, again, somebody that doesn't know about abuse, narcissism, BPD, etc. Um, so it's really a good idea to get another counselor involved. Um, and the other thing you do too is you give them workbooks. The Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker, Codependent No More by um, Melanie Beatty, Beyond Codependent No More by Melanie Beatty. You teach them, you teach them boundaries. And um, they may not always be able to stand up to dad and say no, but if dad starts raging or if dad starts guilt tripping or doing anything they are uncomfortable with, I, I hit buttons without knowing what I was doing. Okay, so we, not because we are trying to figure out what's real, what's not, it's the cognitive dissonance. And so when we've been hit with all of this, oh my God, is this real, is this not real? What was real? Um, none of it was. You gotta remember, these people do not love. They do not love. They do not understand empathy. They don't understand love. Love to them is a manipulation. Love to them is, you know, control. They. they really seriously do not we don't mean anything more to them than the spoon we are a spoon we we are a spoon there is no spoon, is no spoon. Um, <laughs> so we really are nothing more than an object to them and so love is nothing more than a manipulation they wouldn't understand love if it walked up and did the watusi with them which i'm pretty sure it did so that's why you're doing that is you're trying to figure out what was real what wasn't read object of my affection read you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them cha-cha by not to use online dating. So uh, where are you supposed to meet?